Hey there everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, a big big welcome to you. This week's topic for discussion is stainless steel crowns. We'll be discussing the various categories for stainless steel crowns, their indications and contraindications, the technique and the armamentarium involved in placing a stainless steel crown and its various modifications. Now most of these subtopics are asked as both short and long questions in our exam. So I hope that by the end of this video you're very thorough with the topic. So grab your pens and your notebooks and let's jump right in. So what are stainless steel crowns? These are prefabricated crown forms that are adapted to individual teeth and cemented with a biocompatible looting agent. Now these were first introduced by this company called Rocky Mountain in the year 1947 but they were bought to people by Humphrey and Engel in the year 1950 and later the preparation for the tooth before the placement of the crown was given by Mink and Bennett. Now the question is when do we give a stainless steel crown and when do we avoid a stainless steel crown? So let's look at the indications. Starting with the first, that is extensive enamel decalcification. Now, what is that? It's basically the loss of calcium from your teeth and hence to reduce the acidic dissolution, we place a stainless steel crown. Next is rampant caries. Now, that is defined as a widespread, rapidly burrowing type of caries and this leads to faster involvement of pulp and so a placement of a stainless steel crown helps us preventing that. Then we come to recurrent caries. Now these are kids categorized under high risk caries and hence are frequently affected by it. So placement of a crown is necessary in such patients. And then most definitely after pulp therapy. Now why do we give a crown after pulp therapy is because post pulp therapy the tooth becomes excessively brittle and that can be damaged by the masticatory forces and hence to prevent that we need to place a stainless steel crown. Next are any kind of enamel defects. Now these are genetic defects like amelogenesis imperfecta which can be defined as the malfunction of the proteins in the enamel like your enamel and your ameloblastin. Now because of the defect in these proteins, the enamel that is laid down is not strong at all and hence to protect the teeth, we do need to place a stainless steel crown. Then comes fractures of any sort. Then comes bruxism where the patient has a habit of grinding the teeth of the upper and the lower jaw which starts to attreat the teeth and because of that it involves the pulp at a much faster rate and to prevent that we place a stainless steel crown. Next is the usage of a stainless steel crown in the form of an abutment and lastly in the form of a space maintainer. For example, a crown and loop or a crown band and loop space maintainer. So those were the indications for the stainless steel crown. Now let's look at the contraindications. First is the allergy. Now this is related to the nickel present in the stainless steel crown as a component. So the patients do suffer from nickel allergy and that results in contact dermatitis, in rashes, itchiness, urticaria. So a proper history of the allergic condition of the patient is a must before placing a stainless steel crown. And in case the patient has any kind of nickel allergy, then it is contraindicated in such patients. Then is most certainly if the tooth that you're going to be placing the crown on is close to its exfoliation stage, a stainless steel crown is contraindicated. Next is if the patient has any kind of mobility in the tooth. And lastly, if the tooth is in such a condition that no restoration can be performed on the tooth. In all of these cases, stainless steel crowns are contraindicated. Then we come to the classification of the stainless steel crown. Now, these are divided into four different categories based on the trim the composition, the position and the company. According to trim, they are divided into three categories that are untrimmed, pre-trimmed and pre-contoured. Now untrimmed are those crowns which have no trim, no contour as the name suggests and because of that it takes a lot of time in adapting and placing these crowns onto the tooth. Then is the pre-trimmed crowns. Now these have more of a straighter profile but the other thing that these crowns do have is festooning. Now what is festooning is basically matching the crown to the gingival structure of the tooth that you're going to be placing it on. So it follows a gingival line and that is present in the pre-trimmed crowns. And then is the pre-contoured crowns. Now these are both festooned as well as pre-contoured as the name suggests. And because these 
properties are in this crown it re it requires much less time in placing this this crown as compared to the other two then it is based on the composition whether it is a stainless steel crown or a nickel chromium crown and we'll be looking a little deeper into the composition of each of these in the further slides then we move on to the position of where the crown is being placed so you have anterior crowns for the anterior teeth and posterior for the posterior teeth and then these are based on the companies that have given them so they have rocky mountain 3m prime pedo new smile and more have still been launched so that was the classification of the stainless steel crowns now we look at the composition now these as i said are divided into two that are stainless steel crowns and the nickel based or the nickel chromium crowns the stainless steel crowns have three main components that is your iron the chromium and the nickel the iron is present in 67 percent chromium is 17 to 19 percent and nickel is 10 to 13 percent and you have four percent of miscellaneous elements and the nickel based crowns have nickel in the maximum amount that is 76 percent chromium in 15 percent iron in eight percent carbon in 0.08 percent manganese in 0.35 percent and silicon in 0.2 percent so that was the composition of both stainless steel crowns and nickel chromium crowns now moving on to a very important technique in the placement of a crown which is known as the halls technique now this was given by dr nona hall and it's named after her she was a she was a scottish dental professional now there have been a lot of debate about whether this technique is good or not because of the advantages and the disadvantages that it has so let's look at them the advantages of the halls technique is that in this technique you do not require any form of local anesthesia and no drilling is involved because we're not removing any caries in this procedure because there's no la and drilling involved this procedure is much much faster as compared to a conventional stainless steel crown placement and the next thing is that the patient compliance because it is a fast procedure definitely the patient does not get cranky and patient compliance is much much better the disadvantage of this technique is the untreated caries now because we're leaving it untreated and because we're not clearing it out it may result in something more gruesome at a later stage now you must bear in mind that holes technique cannot be used in all the cases if the patient has any kind of sign or symptom that shows that the patient does need pulp therapy then placement of uh, a stainless steel crown through holes technique is completely contraindicated also if you feel that the crown is unrestorable if the crown structure is completely diminished then placement of uh, a stainless steel crown through holes technique is not advisable and if the patient is at a risk of getting bacterial endocarditis then placement of a stainless steel crown through halls technique is contraindicated now let's look at the technique that nonna hall explains in placement of the stainless steel crown first is the crown selection so based on the radiographic analysis and your clinical judgment you choose the appropriate size of the crown then we move on to proximal separation in order to fit the crown properly now these can be done with the help of wooden wedges or plastic wedges in this case we've used orthodontic separators now if you don't know what those are these are tiny elastic bands which are stretched and placed in the proximal areas and the tension that these bands provide help in separating the proximal surfaces of the teeth now once the proper separation is achieved the crown is dried and filled with the looting cement of your choice it is then seated onto the crown and with the help of the finger pressure or by asking the patient to bite down firmly for two to three minutes the excess cement is then leaked out and properly cleaned with the help of a scaler and cotton and that is what the crown looks like once it's finely placed so that was placement of the crown with the help of hall's technique now let's look at the armamentarium that is needed for the placement of the crown through the conventional method starting with the burrs now we need initially the pear shaped burr a tapered fissure burr a needle shaped burr and polishing burrs in terms of pliers we'd be needing the hoe plier the contouring plier or the 114 johnson plier the crimping plier or the 417 plier and the crown removal pliers we'd also be needing the micro motor with the straight handpiece a green stone burr a divider and a metal ruler the steps that we would be undertaking for the crown placement are first to check the preoperative occlusion of the patient selection of the crown 
reduction which would be including the occlusal and the proximal finishing the crown adaptation contouring crimping final fitting cementation and the finishing and polishing starting with the selection of the ground now this can be done by three different methods either by the trial and error method the mesiodistal measurement method or the pre-measured charts method now the trial and error method comes after a lot of experience and lot of practice it's after you've placed too many crowns that you realize which crown might fit which tooth the mesiodistal measurement is done with the help of a divider. Now what you do in this case is you measure the mesiodistal width of the tooth on which you're going to be placing the stainless steel crown and that measurement is used in the selection of the crown. And pre-measured charts have mesiodistal labiolingual and the occlusal cervical length and diameter given for each size of the stainless steel crown which are available in the market and that helps us choose the appropriate crown for the tooth then we move on to recording the occlusion of the patient now this is important as because the patient has had long standing caries the opposing tooth may have extruded or supra erupted also because of the destruction because of the caries there could be a mesial drift in the arch and most importantly Taking the bite of the patient before starting the procedure gives us a guiding plane and it helps us in verification after placement of the crown whether we've maintained the occlusion that the patient had. Now once the bite registration is done we start with the reduction and we start with the occlusal reduction. Now this is done up to 1 to 1.5 mm and it is done with the help of the pear shaped burr. Now while reducing the occlusal plane, care must be taken so that we maintain the anatomical cusp and the ridges that the tooth bears. And to check if appropriate amount of occlusal reduction is done, we can use the adjacent tooth as a guide. Now there's a very important question as to why do we do occlusal preparation before we do the proximal preparation. Now this is because when we do proximal preparation, we have to go a little subgingivally. And what happens when we do that is, bleeding occurs now if we do the proximal preparation first and we do, do the occlusal preparation next if at all the prep of the occlusal surface goes much much more lower as compared to what we need to do and if there is any form of pulp exposure we would not realize that because of all the bleeding which is already present because of the proximal surfaces and hence it is always advised to do the occlusal surface first and the proximal after that then we look at the proximal preparation now this is done with the help of the needle shaped burr and the tapered fissure burr now before starting the proximal preparation care is to be maintained that the adjacent tooth does not get damaged while preparing and hence wedges or separators are supposed to be placed to separate the teeth or else the placement of a band material could also be used another thing that is supposed to be kept in mind while doing the proximal preparation is to avoid ledge formation now what happens if a ledge is formed is that when you're placing the crown onto the tooth you may feel as if the crown is not dipping down and that would lead to much much more preparation of the tooth whereas the main reason underneath that is the ledge and so to avoid the ledge formation, it is always advised to hold the burr at a very slight angle so that you give a 2 to 5 degree taper. Now the reason for that is because in primary teeth, the contact points are much more broader and flatter as compared to the contact points that are seen in permanent teeth. And so holding the burr at a slight angle prevents any form of ledge. Another thing to avoid ledge formation and to give an even preparation is to give a unidirectional flow. So if you're starting lingually, then you start cutting lingually and then you move buckle. You do not go both ways because that would lead to uneven preparation of the proximal surface. Now in terms of buckle and lingual reduction, it is not advised to reduce the tooth from the buckle and the lingual aspect. It can only be used in cases where there is a large buckle bulge present anatomically on the tooth now this is commonly seen in the primary first molar so if at all there is a large buckle bulge a very slight amount of reduction on the buckle surface is required other than that there is no requirement for any form of buckle or lingual reduction now once all of the reduction is done and we go on to trying the crown onto the tooth surface because we are dealing with pediatric patients there is a high chance that the crown may slip and can be aspirated by the patient 
So how do we avoid the stainless steel crown from slippage? Now this can be done by attaching a small hook by the help of soldering it onto the crown and tying a floss around the hook so that the floss remains outside and that can prevent the crown from being aspirated. Another way instead of soldering a hook onto the crown is sticking the floss onto the crown structure with the help of a special glue. Then we move on to crown adaptation. Now these have two main key terms known as festooning and if festooning is not done properly then you lead to blanching. Now let's look at what it is individually now festooning is basically imitating the normal contour of the gingiva as i mentioned before and if the normal contour of the gingiva is not maintained and if the crown actually impinges the gingiva then blanching can be seen now blanching is basically the white hue of the gingiva that you can see in the image and that is because of the lack of the blood supply because of the pressure created by the crown in that area so how do we avoid blanching and how do we properly festoon the crown so starting with placement of the crown onto the tooth once the crown is placed we use a scalar tip and we mark the gingival outline onto the crown we scrape it onto the crown once the marking is done we remove the crown and then with the help of the crown cutting scissors we trim off the excess amount that is impinging into the gingiva now it can also be done with the help of a green stone burr this is although slower as compared to using a crown cutting scissor but it is much much more precise once the excess amount of crown structure is removed the next step is contouring now contouring is basically reciprocating the actual bulge and the actual contours of the tooth and replicating them onto the crown structure now this is done with the help of the number 114 johnson contouring pliers this looks like a ball in a socket plier and using this we contour the buckle and the lingual surfaces of the tooth now if the proper contouring of the crown is not done and if the crown structure remains straight and not curved towards the gingiva that would serve as a spot where the bacteria starts to collect and that would in future lead to recurrent caries or any kind of incipient periodontal disease now once the contouring is done the final step in the crown preparation is crimping now this is done with the help of the 417 crimping pliers and how we use these pliers is that instead of just running it all of the surface we have to gently walk it through the surfaces now i'll be uploading a video tutorial on exactly how to prepare the tooth and how to place the stainless steel crown so all of these steps would get much much more clearer in that video so stay tuned for that video so coming back to crimping as i said it's supposed to be walked through the entire crown and not just dragged along the main uses of crimping is that it provides a proper snap on fit of the crown onto the tooth structure and because of that it prevents any kind of leakage of the cement it prevents any kind of bacterial load infecting the tooth and it provides a proper retention of the crown onto the tooth now once all of these steps are done we check for the final fit of the crown onto the tooth we check for any kind of rough edges and all of these rough edges are finished with the help of the green stone burr now before we cement the tooth onto the crown we also check the occlusion of the patient and we compare it with the bite registration that we did before the procedure to check for the proper retention and the proper adaptation subgingivally a good radiograph also should be taken before cementation of the crown now once we are happy with with all of this we're happy with the fit we're happy with the occlusion we move on to cementing the crown onto the tooth now various types of cements are used for the cementation process you can use the zinc phosphate luting cement the glass inomer luting cement the polycarboxylate luting cement etc once the desired cement is chosen at least 2/3 of the crown should be filled with the luting cement and while placing it onto the tooth structure care has to be maintained that you always go from the lingual surface to the buccal surface now once the crown has been seated you apply finger pressure or you use the crown seater and ask the patient to bite down forcefully and all of the excess cement that has come out should be cleaned with the help of an explorer and with the help of floss 
so that brings us to the end of the conventional technique of placing a stainless steel crown now there are various modifications that have been given by various authors in the placement of the crown so let's look at those now if you have to place adjacent crowns for example if you have to place crowns on both the primary first and the second molar in such cases nash in 1981 said that the occlusal preparation of one tooth should be done before you start the occlusal preparation of the other tooth because in this way you have one tooth as a reference to check how much occlusal reduction you have done also the other reductions that is the reduction done at the proximal aspect and the trimming and the contouring and the cementation of both the crowns should be done at the same time should be done simultaneously and nash mentions to start from the posterior tooth first and then move on to the anterior tooth the next modification is given for cases where there has been a reduction in the arch length because of a long standing caries so if you have arch length loss mac avoy in 1977 mentioned that one crown of normal size could be used and the other crown should be of a smaller size and then we move on to two other modifications given by mink and hill in their 1971 of the undersized crown and the oversized crown now in terms of the undersized crown you need to know that the tooth structure is big itself but the crown that we have available is smaller so what he mentions to do in such cases is to cut a v shaped slit on either the buccal surface or the lingual surface of the tooth and once that is done we place it onto the crown and check for the fit now as much amount of the v shape that has been extended after we've placed the cut onto the crown structure we cut out a small band material piece and we spot weld it onto the crown structure now once that is done we retry the crown onto the tooth again and if the fit is what you desired proper soldering adaptation and then the contouring and crimping of the crown can be done and finally cementation of the crown can be done so that was the undersized crown but the oversized tooth and then we move on to the oversized crown but in such case the tooth is small so you have a bigger crown and the tooth that you have is smaller in such cases what you do is again you place a cut either on the buccal or the lingual surfaces and now as before when we place the orthodontic band in this case we want to reduce the crown structure so what we do is the two ends that we cut out we overlap them and we spot weld the overlapped edges once that is done we check for the fit again and if it is appropriate enough we solder it and then we polish the solder and again the marginal adaptation of the crown is done along with the contouring the crimping and finally the crown is seated so that brings us to the end of stainless steel crowns i hope this video was informative and helpful for all of you guys if you wish to read more about stainless steel crown i'll be linking down the books and the articles that i referred to make this presentation so do check it out if you enjoyed it please hit the like button share it with your friends and subscribe to my channel stay safe and stay healthy bye bye